Hello, this is a podcast on scientific visualization created for the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics online program. So let's talk a little bit about scientific visualization and what it is, as the slide here suggests. SciViz, which is what we call scientific visualization for short, is the science and the art of changing large data sets, numerical data sets, into charts, graphs, animations or movies, and other visual products. The goal of scientific visualization is if you are working with a large data set of, of values, numbers, uh, typically, what you want to be able to use uh, SciViz for is to perform different analyses of these data sets and communicate these results to other people. There are basically three strategies in doing a scientific visualization. Uh, you can use somebody else's visualization to try to understand some uh, scientific event. And here's an example on the right hand side. What you're seeing here is the results of a weather balloon that was launched uh, in December of 2002 uh, from Greensboro, North Carolina. And what you're seeing here is a visualization of thousands of pieces of data that the weather balloon took as it uh, went up through the atmosphere. For example, you see a dark black line on the far right hand side. That uh, black line represents the temperature of the atmosphere as the balloon gets higher. You see a black line on the far left. That's the dew point of the atmosphere as the balloon gets higher. You notice at the very bottom that the one black line and the other black line intersect and if they intersect that's where clouds are formed so we can look at this visualization and we can tell how high above ground uh, we're, we expect to see cloud formation you see some things to the right of the chart that look like uh, arrows with little barbs on them and those are wind indicators so the uh, direction of the of the line represents where the wind is coming from and the different barbs represent different speeds of the wind. So this would be an example where uh, we have some data, the data is visualized, we get a, a, a chart that looks like this and a meteorologist can look at this and say an awful lot of pretty intelligent things about what the weather is doing, uh, at least in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we can also modify existing visualizations. We can take a visualization that somebody else has created and we can add our own parameters to it to modify that. Maybe the person who did the first uh, visualization of the data wasn't interested in some aspect of that data, but we are. So many visualizations are set up so that they are customizable and you are able to add your own uh, flavor or your own interest areas to an existing visualization. And finally, and certainly the hardest thing to do is to create a visualization from scratch. Um, being able to just take a raw data set and from scratch be able to uh, create some type of image. Um, you're going to see a, a, a whole bunch of different uh, types of descriptions of visualization. Uh, you're going to see, for example, data visualization is sort of the, the, the uh, where we're playing. And what that means is mapping data to visual, visual form. And notice on the far left there, SciViz is a subset of DataViz, uh, typically done with science or engineering data, and that's exactly what uh, we are interested in. InfoViz is the subset of, of of data viz, usually with business data or other kinds of abstract data collections, maybe world population data or some other things that are that may or may not necessarily be science or engineering. Uh, you got to be careful you don't confuse scientific visualization with scientific illustration, and that's just using graphics to present some science or engineering uh, concept. So, for example, scientific illustration is used. Uh, very often in the medical field, especially for teaching medical students, so their artists will create very detailed drawings of different parts of um, uh, the human anatomy, muscles, tissues, whatever, and that's scientific illustration. VizSim um, is what you do in video games. Uh, that's where you use graphics to visually create a place or a process. Um, I guess as many of you, most of you are avid video game players and VizSim is what those people are doing to create realistic uh, uh, scenarios, places, processes, that type of thing. Okay. 
All right, you should remember this. Uh, science is the study how nature behaves. So you have observational science, you have experimental science, you have theoretical science, and our interest area, of course, is computational science. And we use scientific visualization in all of these areas. So we'll take data we collect observationally, and we'll make uh, uh, animations and graphics out of that. We'll certainly take experimental data. We'll take the results of some theoretical mathematics and visualize what that looks like. And certainly in computational science, uh, scientific visualization is a huge component of what we do in computational science. Um, here are some of the techniques that you're going to uh, be exposed to. Uh, certainly the first one is data identification and acquisition. You've got to have some data. You've got to understand what that data is. You've got to get the data. Um, and that happens in a variety of different ways. Um, the next step typically is some, you're going to do some data analysis. You're going to do some filtering. So you may uh, say, I want to uh, change all the, I want to, take my data and I want to uh, represent it using these colors or I'm going to represent it using some other colors. We might want to filter the data. We might want to say uh, we only want to see data, a uh, particular subset of data. So there's lots of uh, different ways that you can look at that data that you've acquired and identified. Data rendering is typically what we say. That's when you actually take all of your analytical work, your filtering work, and tell the computer to actually render or create the animation or the image. So data rendering is a step where you actually produce the image. Okay? And one of the working assumptions here, by the way, is, is that scientific visualization is both a process and a product. You, yes, you are going to produce a graphic or you're going to produce an animation as the end product of your scientific visualization work. But it's also a process. You, you've identified your data. You think you know something about it. But in the process of creating a pretty picture, uh, you should be learning a lot more about your data. So for example, you may have some activity where you've uh, visualized the data and uh, all of a sudden something pops out at you that you didn't expect to see. So that's part of the process of scientific visualization. Uh, here's an, here's a just a graphic image. This is the aspirin molecule. And what you see here is that I've done a visualization where I've put what's called an electrostatic potential map around there. It's very pretty. You see some nice blues and reds and greens. And while this is a very pretty uh, diagram, those blues and reds and greens actually mean something chemically. They tell me how this particular molecule of aspirin is going to react in the human body. So um, if I only was looking at the raw data, it'd be very hard to tell what this molecule is going to do when I uh, put it into somebody's body. But with the greens and the reds and the blues, they will tell me something uh, important about the, the, how this particular drug behaves. Okay, a little bit about data acquisition, lots of sources. You can just do empirical data collection, which typically means you're collecting data in the lab, so lab experiments, remote sensing devices. We send um, devices to Mars. We send devices deep into the ocean. We send devices all over the place, and they can collect a lot of data for us. Okay. We certainly use a lot of computational models, so we can run models. That When we run a model, it's going to produce a whole bunch of numerical data, so we can do numerical experiments computationally. And so there's many, many ways that we can collect, collect data. So here's a picture of a remote sensing device. This is a, uh, a chromatograph, so it's collecting data about chemicals for me. Uh, here's a guy uh, out in Antarctica somewhere. You see he's got his, his cold weather gear on, and he's monitoring and collecting data from a remote sensing device. Um, here's an old picture. These slides are a little bit dated, but this is an old picture of a supercomputer. This is a Cray T3D supercomputer that I used to work on uh, when I was at the North Carolina Supercomputing Center. So a, a pretty big machine, $20 million, and it does about a, a trillion calculations per second. But again, this is an older machine. Okay. Data filtering, we, uh, we, we will filter data to prepare data for rendering. Um, a lot of times we're going to have very large data sets and we may not want to see all of that data. So we will use it to remove data. Uh, we want to use it to look at specific parts of the data. And typically we have to write uh, a program to do this, although the new visualization tools uh, have built-in data filtering uh, 
options that make it a lot easier than having to write a program. So here's an example of a program that I wrote a number of years ago. Uh, this is for a, um, an atmospheric data set. And what you should see here, if you look about uh, a third of the way down, you'll see the words, what value do you want? And it says the, the options W, I, S, P, A, U, and S, U. And what the user types in there is winter, spring, autumn, or summer. And once you do that, once the user does that, it takes the entire data set and only uh, chooses those values that are related to winter, spring, autumn, or summer. So that's a data filtering. So in this case, we're, fil we're filtering out data by the season of the year. Uh, data rendering, you'll see the rendering there on, on the, the on the right, that's a picture of a protein. But this is the process by which raw numerical data is transformed into a visual image or animation. Okay? It's part science and part art. Uh, the people who are really good at scientific visualization are people who have a good sense of color. Uh, they have some nuance in terms of how they use color. You'll see that in some of the labs you're asked to do where uh, you'll be asked to brighten the image up or contrast it or change the colors. And if you are uh, particularly good at being able to nuance colors a little bit, have a little bit of an artistic eye, that will make you a good scientific visualization scientist. Okay, and then the rendering again is process and product. So again, in the, pro in the, in the process of doing the rendering, you're going to learn a lot about your data. And, but at the end of the day, what you want is a product that you can show people and communicate your science. So roughly the visualization process looks like this. You have some data, uh, you filter it, you get a smaller data set, you um, put that data on some sort of a map of some sort so you have a sense of what it is you're trying to render. Uh, you get a, a graphical format out ready to go, you render it, and at the end of the day you have your image. So all along the way here, starting from data at the top left to image at the far right, you are learning more about your data and being able to say more intelligent things about that data from a scientist's perspective. Um, some of the tools that are available, certainly Microsoft Excel, and, and that's a pretty ubiquitous one. Uh, GNU Plot is an older tool that I wrote a book on, on how to use that for scientific visualization. And what you're seeing there on the right is uh, a um, uh, a contour plot that's been created using a uh, new plot. You see I've got the image there in red and then I have all the contour lines down below uh, mapped to a grid. Okay? ImageJ is a, a software program that you'll use for the labs in the NCSSM online program. You'll also use something called Paraview, a very sophisticated package which uses something called the Visual Toolkit to render images. There's lots of other tools. There are discipline specific tools, for example, in chemistry. Um, I use some uh, visualization tools that are only useful for chemists. There are certainly some for physicists and biologists and everybody else out there. Um, there's lots of viewers out there, so there's lots of tools that you can use to view somebody else's visualization that they've created. Um, and that depends on what the visualization is that you want to view. There, and there are lots of Java applets out there that make use of visualization, so they will present you with a, a animation or a graphical image, and you can interact with that uh, animation or graphical Im uh, anim um, image by using various Java tools. Okay, a little bit about Excel. We're not going to spend much time on this. It's a pretty ubiquitous tool. Everybody has it. Um, ubiquitous means everybody has it. It's a good calculation and viz tool. Um, you did this visualization when you did the uh, Gaussian plume model. Okay, it runs on both uh, Windows and Macs. It's a pretty powerful viz tool. Has a relatively short learning curve. Uh, one of the limitations of Excel is you can only have about 250,000 total data points. Um, you can't load really, really big data sets into Excel, so that's a limitation. And it does have some wizard capabilities that will guide you through the visualization process to try to make things a little bit easier on you.
Uh, new plot again, as I mentioned, it's a command line tool, so you actually have to learn commands, and uh, as you see there on the far right hand side. So here's a uh, new plot program I wrote to visualize some diabetes data. Uh, it's free for both Macs and PCs. It's a little dated now, not many people use it, but it's still out there and it's still uh, very powerful. has a relatively short learning curve, although you do have to learn how to program a little bit. You see there's lots of set commands there in the new plot, so I set the title. I set what data style I want, I set my X labels, um, I set my time formats, I set my X range, so on and so forth. And then when I'm ready to plot, I actually say the word plot my diabetes data and I put a title on it and there we go. So it's a pretty short learning curve and you can manipulate the data with lots of functions. So new plot is a very powerful mathematical tool and you can manipulate your data using mathematical functions. Uh, ImageJ is a great program. It's open source and cross-platform. It's developed at the National Institutes of Health. One of the really nice features about ImageJ is there's lots of plugins and macros, and you will use uh, some astronomy plugins and macros uh, for the labs in the computational science online course. It can read in many types of formats of, of data. Um, so uh, lots of options there and it has lots of op op operations like smoothing and interactive 3D and animations and histograms and lots of specialized operations. You can spend uh, a whole semester learning how to use ImageJ with all the stuff that is built in with that. Uh, PowerView is developed by the Department of Energy, United States government. It's also cross-platform and open source, which means it's free. Uh, it's based on something called a Visual Toolkit standards, and it has very advanced visualization capabilities. This is big boy, big girl uh, scientific visualization, lots and lots of options, and you can look at very, very complicated and very, very large data sets using PowerView. Uh, here's a picture of PowerView, and we'll uh, play with PowerView a little bit in the uh, in the labs for this particular uh, week. And here you see a visualization of, of Mount St. Helens, and this is a rotatable image. I can't rotate it here, but it's a rotatable image, and so you see the you can see very detailed uh, differences in elevation as we go up Mount St. Helens. Again, the three strategies are to use existing visualizations, modify existing visualizations, and create visualizations from scratch. And in the labs this week, you will primarily be creating visualizations from scratch and make pretty pictures that look like this. And we'll see you online. Thanks for listening.